All right. Hello and uh, welcome to everyone here. Thanks for uh, continuing to join us throughout the uh, day for our Lithum Partners 2024 Investor Select Conference. My name is Robert Bloom, Managing Partner, Lithum Partners. Uh, I'm excited during this webcast here, we welcome Cadrenal Therapeutics, ticker symbol of CVKD on the NASDAQ. Uh, joining us from the company is uh, the company's chief medical officer, Dr. Douglas Sordo. Uh, also joining us is uh, Joe Penginis. Uh, Joe is the Managing Director of Research at H.C. Wainwright, uh, whom I've asked to uh, uh, moderate today's fireside chat. Joe covers a, a wide array of uh, healthcare companies there at H.C. Wainwright, including Cadrino. Uh, before I do turn it over to Joe, I just want to remind everyone that management is available for one-on-one -on -one meetings throughout the conference here. Uh, if you've not already signed up uh, for a one-on-one -on -one and would like to schedule one, you can send me an email. Uh, that's bloom, B-L-U-M, at lithampartners.com. You can also visit our website, lithampartners.com forward slash select 2024. From there, you can click on the investor registration tab and, uh, and get your selections in there. So with that said, Joe, uh, thanks so much for uh, participating in the event and, and the floor is all yours. Great. Thanks a lot, Robert. Uh, really happy to be part of the Lithum Partners event here and uh, happy to do it. Um, so again, welcome to the fireside chat with uh, Cadrino. Um, as Robert said, my name is Joe Panginas. I'm the head of research and managing director at HC Wainwright and very happy to do this talk with Dr. Douglas Lasordo, chief medical officer of Cadrino and who has had a very fine career thus far in cardi cardiology. And I'm very happy we can spend this time. Um, because I don't want to make the most of our time, I want to dive right on to the company's development of tocarferin, a potentially differentiated blood thinner. So again, thank you very much, Doug, for doing this. And like I said, let's dive right in. But first, I want to go through a little bit of high level first regarding the anticoagulation market. Obviously, people are most familiar with the decades use of warfarin and coumadin, um, followed by the later development of such drugs like Eliquis. Um, the efficacy has been quite clear, but can you define where they are best suited and where they are potentially lacking? Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Joe. And that's absolutely a perfect way to start this conversation uh, at the high level. Uh, you know, it's interesting. If you think about cardiovascular disease and treatment or secondary prevention, uh, two big categories come to mind, really. We're talking about things that block arteries, right? One of the things that block arteries, plaque and clots. Uh, the plaque blocking has been addressed over decades with the development of statins and then more recently some other agents that are designed to lower cholesterol and so forth. Then the other side of the coin, the clotting side of things is where, where we're operating. And it is a huge, important uh, part of the cardiovascular treatment uh, paradigm, uh, preventing unwanted clots. The, you know, the initial anti-clotting drugs or clot-dissolving drugs were really, in some ways, discovered accidentally. Um, you know, the story of, of warfarin is fascinating for those that don't know it, and it's, but it's worth summarizing because it actually plays into why tocarfrin has come along. Warfarin was, was, I always say, discovered by a farmer uh, who noticed that his cows were bleeding to death. Uh, and so he put one of those cows on his truck, brought it up to the University of Wisconsin, and the scientists there ultimately determined that the bleeding in those cows was the result of a mold that was growing on clover hay that was in storage for winter use. And they were able to extract from that mold a substance that ultimately led to the formulation of warfarin. And incidentally, warfarin, the first four letters of warfarin, W-A-R-F, stand for Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. So the, the, the Alumni Research Foundation funded the work that led to the formulation of warfarin. That was the, the first anticoagulant to come, oral anticoagulant to come onto the market uh, back in 1954. When you think about it, that the fact that there's been no improvement on the chemistry of warfarin over all those years until now with the carfarin, it's fascinating because when you think about the statin market, right? So mevastatin came out and then about every year or two after that, there was an improvement in chemistry, potency, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, now the, 
the uh, lipid lowering, the oral lipid lowering agents are fantastically potent and have done a great job, but nothing really happened on the warfarin side of things. What did happen, of course, was the uh, was the identification of oral agents that were able to target individual arms of the coagulation cascade. You know, nature is pretty smart. You know, the manufacturer uh, really knew what they were doing uh, when they put the human body together. Uh, and, and so that things that are really important, like stopping bleeding, are very redundant systems, as the engineers would say, right? Your, your, your clotting system is not, a, is not a one shot deal. There are multiple arms of the coagulation system, <clears throat> which makes it very, very effective. Uh, now, um, the single target agents were developed specifically to uh, reduce clotting, but also to avoid bleeding complications and also frankly, to avoid some of the testing issues that are required when one uses warfarin. And those drugs have been very successful. Obviously, like you mentioned, Joe, I will just say the Eliquis class of drugs. And there are some other agents that are coming out now in, in development, also targeting single arms of the coagulation cascade. So the development plans for tocarfrin, which is like warfarin, a vitamin K antagonist, but with much better chemistry, as I'll explain, those development plans started with a very broad scope, as you would expect, because warfarin was really the only anticoagulant out there for a very long time to prevent clotting and embolization in settings like atrial fibrillation, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolus, and so on and so forth. And so naturally the target of a, of a better version of warfarin we look at all those indications. And then what could not have been predicted by the folks that were developing to carfrin at that time was the advent of these single target agents that ended up being effective and also easier for patients to use, easier for doctors to use. Uh, and, and so they kind of took over chunks of the anticoagulation market uh, as the data came out to show that they were you know, more effective and safer and easier to use than warfarin. But what also happened during that period was the identification of areas where those single target agents just didn't work. Blocking a single arm of the coagulation cascade, it turned out, was not good enough uh, for preventing clotting, uh, let's say, in patients with end-stage renal disease and atrial fibrillation, or in patients with mechanical heart valves or left ventricular assist devices or autoimmune conditions like antiphospholipid syndrome. In those cases, when the single target agents, let's say, dip their toes into those waters, it did not work out well. And not only did those agents fail, but they failed quickly, really pointing out the fact that certain areas of anticoagulation really required the, um, the broader inhibition of coagulation that's offered by a vitamin K antagonist. And in, in so doing and highlighting that need, then the fact that the chemistry of the originally discovered, not designed, but discovered vitamin K antagonist really came into sharp focus and the opportunity was seen to improve that chemistry and have a vitamin K antagonist uh, that was a vitamin K antagonist so capable of tackling the types of situations where that pathway of anticoagulation is required, or with a drug that's easier to use, more reliable, safer, and so on and so forth. And so, uh, so that's that's kind of the the Reader's Digest version of of the the history of of, of uh, anticoagulation and, and of uh, the beginning of the development of tocarfrin. That that's fantastic. I think it's better than a Reader's Digest version. I think that's a great uh, background there. And I guess um, you, you mentioned a couple of words there. You know, chemistry and history and what have you. You know, focusing more on exactly what tocarfrin is. Obviously, you said it's a vitamin K antagonist, and you know, sometimes might people might say, oh, they're all the same vitamin K antagonists or statins are all the same, but you mentioned chemistry a bunch of times. You know, How should people view tocarfrin as different from warfarin and what are its differentiating components as a vitamin K antagonist? Yeah, so you know, look, uh, the, the chemistry is the key here. Um, and 
you know, the medicinal chemist who designed uh, uh, tocarfrin really was looking at the, the landscape of drugs that were out there, trying to find uh, drugs that had a chemistry that was maybe not quite optimal and where he thought he could, could help and design a better drug. And tocarfrin was really at the top of his list. And the reason for that is that uh, warfarin uh, is metabolized by virtue of its chemistry, is metabolized by the cytochrome P450 pathway. And there are several, let's say, uh, issues with the drug going through that pathway. Number one is a lot of drugs are metabolized by that pathway. So you've got competition right away, uh, which means that the metabolism of warfarin can change if other drugs that need to be metabolized by that pathway are added to the patient's regimen or taken away from the patient's regimen. I can tell you as a, as a practicing cardiologist, uh, I was always worried uh, about my patients on warfarin because I knew that if a well-meaning clinician started them on an antibiotic, uh, you know, in a few days, they were likely to be in the emergency room uh, with a bleeding problem because their warfarin metabolism changed as a result of, of that new drug. The other issue- the simplicity oh, of eating too much broccoli. <laughs> or that, you know, right? I mean, it's, you know, it would change the diet, but, uh, yeah. but you know, and, and then on top of the that competition issue is the fact that the cyclone P450 pathway has genetic variants that result in very different le uh, rates of metabolism. So if you have a, sorry for the jargon, a CYP2C9 variant, it's part of the pathway. It's a very common uh, it's not a mutation. It's just a variant allele that changes how your your overall pathway works, number one. Number two, there are drugs that upregulate and downregulate the function of those different alleles. So it's a very complex uh, pathway for metabolism. And so the medicinal chemist looked at that and said, I'm going to design a molecule that retains the vitamin K antagonist properties of warfarin, but I'm going to use the principles of retro metabolic drug design. What does that mean? That means you start out targeting a metabolic pathway and build the chemistry so that the drug will naturally find its way to be metabolized by that pathway. And so he, he decided to have this drug, design this drug so it would be metabolized by this human carboxyl esterase 2. Uh, enzyme system. Why? Well, reason number one, it's abundant. As far as we can tell, it's insaturable. So the issues of competition are not, not that meaningful. Uh, number two, just by luck, not a lot of drugs are metabolized through that pathway. And number three, while there are genetic variants of components of that pathway, they've never been shown to alter, significantly alter the metabolism of drugs that are going through that pathway. So really, you know, uh, a modification of the chemistry while retaining uh, the mechanism of action that was designed to, and in fact has led to, uh, a drug that is easier to use, more stable, uh, more reliable levels of anticoagulation, and, and therefore safer. Uh, so that's that's the the story of the chemistry. It's why I I keep talking about the chemistry because it's central to the importance of this drug. <clears throat> that, that's fantastic. No, I appreciate that because that's a great segue. Um, you know, even during your introduction, you talked about uh, you know somewhat of a history for tocarfrin. So I guess it's you know great to get into now. You know, summarizing the clinical path that the drug has been on. It's been through multiple studies already in quite a lot of patients, and I think a lot of people don't necessarily realize that. Um, you know, what are the key takeaways on the activity of the drug historically that you've seen? Yeah, so it's it's interesting, right? Because uh, Cadrenal is a is a pretty new company. We're we're about a year old on the on the public market. So it's older than that, you know, when it was private. Uh, but nevertheless, a relatively newly minted company that has a drug with a, over a thousand patients of data, and really has a pathway to uh, filing an NDA. That is to getting to the market. That will require one additional clinical trial. So it's a very unusual situation 
uh, to have a you know a, a relatively new company uh, that is uh, you could say phase three ready, but really my my view of it is that we're one study away from um, from filing an NDA, and, and the reason for that is that the uh, the prior developers of this did a really nice job of of testing this drug. Uh, in uh, in in vitro studies and preclinical studies and designing and executing really good clinical trials that have yielded abundant evidence that document the drug's efficacy and safety. And so now, with our you know sort of narrowed focus on areas where we know vitamin K antagonists are required, you know, deciding on uh, the the indications to pursue becomes I you know I won't say it's easy but it's really uh, an area of focus for us because we, we know where the drug, where the vitamin K pathway ha has to be used. And so we have uh, disease targets that make perfect sense medically uh, and where we know we can do a lot of benefit uh, for patients, right? So vitamin K antagonists are still used, all that's out there is warfarin. Uh, and I think that you know patients and doctors alike will be very enthusiastic uh, when we are able to show them the difference between using carfarin and warfarin. Got it. So if you could just sort of maybe a sentence or two, you know, what were some of the key clinical findings previously that led to some of your focus today, which uh, yeah. we'll talk about next? Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, thank you for that uh, follow-up question, because this is very important. So, you know, I've, I've said a few times in a few ways, it's better, we have a better drug. Right. Okay. Well, that's fine. You know, you're the chief medical officer. You better believe that. Uh, yeah. But but how do you prove it? So the way that we we evaluate the quality, if you will, of anticoagulation when you're using a, a vitamin K antagonist, the common measurement is something called time and therape therapeutic range (TTR). What is a TTR? Well, when you're taking a vitamin K antagonist, you measure your coagulation by something called an INR, the International Normalized Ratio, and it really just shows the if you will, the thinning of the blood, the inhibition of the ability of the blood to clot. And there's a very defined range of where you want your INR to be between two and three. Your INR is probably one. My INR is one word because we're not anticoagulated. Our blood is in a normal state of coagulation. If you want to anticoagulate, you want your INR to be around two to three. So every time you measure the, uh, the INR in a patient on a vitamin K antagonist, you know what the INR is. And when you accumulate all that data over the a period of time, when you're in that range, that's time in the therapeutic range. And when you're outside of that range, if you're too low, you're gonna be prone to clotting. If you're too high, you're gonna be prone to bleeding. So in all the studies that have been done with tocarfrin to date, and especially, and this is, this is really the, the most important point in comparisons to warfarin, Tocarfrin beats warfarin's TTR um, across the spectrum of you name the indication. Uh, it doesn't matter patient age group, whatever. And these were in, these were in double blind randomized controlled studies in which uh, and and the really important part is the coagulation dosing was done by a blinded dose group. So think about that. You got a bunch of cardiologists or hematologists sitting around a table, and they're looking at these INR valves and saying, okay you know, increase the dose, decrease the dose, really precise control. And in spite of that precise control by experts in anticoagulation, tocarfrin still won by a significant margin. So th the point is, you know, you can't, uh, you, what you can't do is, uh, is beat this metabolic pathway, no matter how hard you try with warfarin, you know, and, and let's face it, you know, when you're, when you're treating a patient with warfarin as a clinician, you don't have a team of people, you know, looking at your INR values to help you decide how to dose your patient, right? You're a busy clinician. You look at the value, you know, and, and you make a decision on the spot. Even when with a team of people looking at these values, they couldn't beat the carfarin uh, by dose adjusting. So, I mean, that tells you very clearly uh, the power of picking the right metabolic pathway and designing your drug around it. That's actually very helpful. And, uh, you know, good setup for, uh, you know, I guess to ask now, 
where is Cadrenal taking tocarferin? Um, you talked about earlier, as we, you know, as I mentioned, drugs like Eliquis and others where there are areas where they're, where they're not effective. Um, you know, maybe can you describe, you mentioned AFib, for example, um, you know, where is the need in those areas since drugs like Eliquis are not necessarily effective? Absolutely. So, uh, so we're looking at a few areas. One of them uh, is in patients with end-stage renal disease and um, atrial fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation writ large, I would say, is taken care of by the Eliquis class drugs nicely. But what's really interesting, and, and it's terrible for people with end-stage renal disease, they have not been helped by any drug. There is no evidence anywhere of any drug reducing the thrombotic and thromboembolic events in patients with end-stage renal disease. Um, and not because it hasn't been tried, right? There was a, a study recently that came out in which, um, you know, apixaban uh, was, was tried uh, in those patients. And the study wasn't really completely enrolled, but even so, it showed no, not even a hint of benefit uh, at all. And so, so you've got a class of patients that actually has extremely high stroke rates and extremely high rates of thromboembolic events and so forth. And by and large, they don't get any anticoagulation. It's, it's somewhat counterintuitive, but it's because clinicians say, well, I don't have any data to, that shows that I can help. I mean, I would think an anticoagulant should be able to help, but there's no data. And so I'm not gonna prescribe something that I can't, uh, feel confident is going to make my patient's life better. So that's a target population for us. We have an orphan designation and fast track designation there. Um, and so we're, we're going to be working with the agency to fine tune some of the, the endpoints. But so that's, that's a really important study where I think we can do a lot of good. Another couple of areas that we're looking at very closely, patients with left ventricular cyst devices. So the world, the world of LVADs, I'll call them LVADs for short, is very interesting. The devices have evolved very nicely <clears throat> over the years. And you know, the current version of the LVAD um, has done a great job of reducing the risk of thrombosis, but the patients still require anticoagulation. The anticoagulation used is a vitamin K antagonist, so, so warfarin. The problem is that even though the bleeding rates have come down, I'm sorry, the, the clotting rates have come down, the bleeding rates are still very substantial. And the reason for that is, you guessed it, the challenge of maintaining stable anticoagulation with warfarin. If you look at all the studies that have been done in LVAD patients and look at that TTR number, time and therapeutic range, it runs below 50%. Now the target is 70% or above. You want your, your, third, your INR to be between two and three, at least 70% of the time. If it was me, I would say, you know, better than 80 or 90, but, you know, generally speaking, 70% and above is considered to be, you know, uh, um, um, high quality anticoagulation. With LVAD patients, it's less than 50%. Even in recent clinical studies that have been done, again, in this very, regimented environment or anticoagulation is watched very carefully, uh, the patients are running in the 50s uh, for, for TTR. And so that's that's an area where we think we can obviously, obviously do a lot of good. We already have data in mechanical heart valves that shows that tocarferin leads to a um, higher level of TTR in those patients in, in randomized double-blind studies. And then again, I mentioned autoimmune conditions. Uh, there's a condition called antiphospholipid syndrome. It is associated with an increased risk for thrombosis. Once a patient with APS has a clot, they're generally started on warfarin. And again, in those patients, the TTRs run 50% or less. And so there's an opportunity there for us, for us to help those patients uh, with, a, with an agent that leads to higher quality of anticoagulation. So we're exploring all of these different options where I think uh, our improved vitamin K antagonists can really help patients and, and make their lives safer uh, and better.
Great. No, I really appreciate that landscape view. So I guess, you know, the, the key important question now that we'll end up with for the sake of time, if you don't mind, is, you know, sort of where's Cadrenal right now? You just, you mentioned about being in regulatory discussions. I think end-stage renal disease sounds like the lead indication. You know, what what is your sort of uh, wish list? What are you waiting to get from the agency? And when do you think you can get the pivotal study started? Yeah, so we're we're aiming to be um, in a clinical trial by the by the end of this year, um, and so the the decision on uh, the pathway is going to be driven by a few things. Those regulatory conversations are always very important, right? So we want to find uh, for us and for our investors the fastest path to a filing, right? So what's going to get us to the end zone and get this drug on the market for one of those patient groups, and you know. Honestly, I'm agnostic. I think the patients in all those groups that I just mentioned will benefit greatly by our drug. But the, the important thing for us now is to get through a pivotal study that establishes once and for all, even though you know we know from all the data, we know the drug works better than warfarin, but we've got to show, show this in a, in a target group, in an in a, in a agreed upon study that gets us to filing. And so we're working very hard right now uh, internally and with the agency to refine those pathways. And as soon as we reach a conclusion on the, you know, like I said, the fastest pathway to get us to the market, um, then everybody will know and we'll start those studies right away. But we're getting everything set up in the meantime so that in some ways, almost the this, the choice of, of the specific path um, you know, when we get to that point, will not be um, th that difficult. Once we know the path, we're going to have everything else set up to go. And so it'll be plug and play at that point. That's fantastic. And I guess a real key reminder here, and also a little bit of disclosure that I um, forgot in the beginning, I do cover Cadrenal with a buy rating, is that you're starting off a very strong base here. You're not going into studies to see what the drug will do. You have a long history of positive efficacy, and hopefully that helped de-risk your path forward. So, um, Doug, really appreciate all the comments. Um, thank you for doing this very much. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Robert. Thanks, uh, uh, incredible conversation uh, to, to both of you. Thank you so much for, for your participation today. Found it incredibly informative, and, and I think our audience uh, will as well. A uh, couple of just quick reminders. Again, if you'd like to schedule one on one with Cadrenal here throughout the conference, uh, shoot me an email, bloom at lithumpartners.com, or you can visit, uh, again, visit the website. Uh, if you'd like to get a hold of Joe uh, as well here from AC Wainwright, please reach out to me. I would be happy to uh, to coordinate an introduction to you. Again, send me a, send me an email there. We have a, a number of uh, additional webcast and fireside chats coming up today. You can visit the website, lithumpartners.com forward slash select 2024. Click on the presentations tab in the top left-hand corner and, uh, and and be able to link to, uh, to, to each of the webcasts from there. Again, Joe, Doug, thank you very much for your time today. It's greatly appreciated and we hope everyone enjoys the conference. Thank, thank you. you gentlemen.